Okay, so um, hi, I'm Kate Ross Smith from Mango. Um, those of you who are quite eagle eyed might notice that kind of a week ago today um, I was Jonathan Chard. Um, so unfortunately, Jonathan couldn't make it um, at the last minute. So Rich and I are going to step in and do a bit of a double act. Um, so today seems to be the day for double acts. So um, you're definitely in the right session. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about the data science workbench. So um, I'm going to briefly go over kind of the reasoning behind the data science workbench, which is um, a product at Mango. Um, and then uh, Rich is going to give you um, some very special demos. Um, so, and hopefully the internet will work. Right. So. Um, I'm sure you are all aware that um, data science has really become popular um, as a subject area kind of in the last 30 years. Um, but it's been around for a long time. Um, it's kind of, we see it the culmination of um, a couple of things. So things like visualisation, um, computing technology, um, data storage and modelling and statistics and um, really kind of over the last 30 years those subject areas have come together to help each other out um, to provide something really useful to the organisation um, which we call data science um, and more than that over the last kind of 10 years data has gone from really just being a justification so you, you do a project um, you see what comes out of that and you use data to um, you use data analysis to really find out what you've what you found out from what you've done um, it's moved from there really to kind of driving projects in the first place so examining data and understanding what you want to do um, from that point onwards rather than kind of plucking something out of the air um, and also supporting it um, in operations, things like customer service, areas like that really have um, increased um, over the last really 10 years um, because of data science. Um, and so because of that, there's really been a drive to industrialise analytics. Um, what do we really mean by that though? So um, in our kind of thinking, industrialisation is about um, creating quick data turnaround. Um, so getting your data, um, just like the guys from Allianz showed us, getting the data and turning this around, this analysis around really quickly um, in real time. Um, and also providing a turnkey process, so um, not just um, sitting in your little um, R studio terminal and um, doing uh, some really good analytics, but actually um, opening this to be able to go from kind of the beginning stages, getting your data, doing all your analysis, all in one kind of smooth step. Um, okay, so why? why? Why would we ever want to do this? Um, one of the big drivers is um, competition. So um, data has, data analysis has really become popular because um, industry is more competitive um, and data can really give us um, the kind of uh, leverage to be able to um, create a better return against our competition and that's great uh, but it's also really about moving the um, analysis from um, the purview of just the data scientists into business users as well so it's not about just modelers doing models and understanding this. This is about business users being able to take this analysis that um, other people have done and run with it. Um, and so we now need to think about kind of how. How do we do that? How do we make something that's secure, that's automated, accessible, that's well packaged? So it's not just kind of about knowing what the workflow process is. It's packaged up so someone can take that, use it, and um, be able to run with the data analysis um, in a kind of seamless one step type process. Um, well, one of the uh, things that um, we really like about Mango um, is that um, we're not just data scientists. So we're a company that have got some other breeds as well. So we have some good project managers um, and we have a really good dev team as well. Um, and although they can be a bit um, different, um, we can learn a lot from them. So um, DevOps is really kind of a philosophy 
um, about uh, continuous improvement um, and communication um, in a kind of more seamless type way. Um, and I think data science can really learn a lot from DevOps. Um, because they really know how to do this stuff. They've already answered a lot of these questions. There's no point in us doing it again. Um, they've got the answers for us. Um, they can kind of tell us how to automate these processes, um, like how to embed uh, automatic process triggers um, in what we do. They can tell us how to evolve um, our analysis, evolve our modelling. So instead of kind of working on our own, head down, um, for six months and then releasing something, they can tell us that actually what users really want um, is to release often and release early so that we can learn to react to that. Um, they can also tell us to um, adapt and feedback that um, although we really want to, maybe as data scientists we don't always know the answers. Sometimes we have to ask other people too. Um, and so being able to um, talk to our community talk to um, industry and find out what they want is really important um, and also to be able to improve continuously all of the time um, and that's really where the data science workbench comes in um, Rich is now going to come and uh, take over Thank you, Kate. Uh, as Kate said, yes, I'm also not Jonathan Chard. Um, so I'm, uh, my name is Richard Pugh from Manga Solutions. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Data Science Workbench, which is a, a project that's been ongoing at Mango now for about five years, something like that. So <clears throat> uh, to give you a bit of background, um, we've been uh, in existence now for about 13 years at Mango. Um, we've been building and performing analytic um, uh, applications and analysis now for kind of 13 years, right? And the thing is, because we work very often, especially in the early days in regulatory agencies, we get audited. And we still get audited like you know, maybe once every two months, right? So anyone, anyone uh, out there who gets audited around analysis, you know, it's an interesting uh, meeting. Um, and, uh, you know, when people come in, they, they want to know about how we control analysis. How can we ensure we can reproduce results? How we ensure that the software we're using, which is R, is producing the, same, the right results every time. So we, we kind of got a lot of those questions 13 years ago, and we still get these questions. So we had to evolve a philosophy. So what we did is we talked to some of the people in the office who uh, are quite different, as Kate says, uh, to us, in that they are sort of IT people, we've got like Java development teams and so on. We had to kind of build an infrastructure around that. And what we found is every time we took like a development technology or a development approach, we found that as analysts, some of it was useful and some of it really wasn't. So if you take version control, right, so hopefully, um, so a quick show of hands, who's using version control like daily? Right, cool, right, we're all using version control, or most of us are, that's perfect, right? But we actually think about what version control was designed to do. It was designed so that 20 people could actually build something in the center there that actually, um, you know, would all work, and you understand that when that person changes that thing and that person's that, you know, you can hit the blame button and work out who, who broke that build, right? As analysts, we use version control in a slightly different way. So every time we came across things like version control and continuous integration and so on, we found that we would take that as a concept, and then we would look at it as analysts and go, well, you know what, that 20% we don't need, throw that away. We just need this 80%, and that's what we need. So we had to do that quite a lot, is actually work at how a development approach and DevOps would apply to an analyst's workflow. Um, and in doing that, we also started working with clients around things like um, programming for analysts, so you know how you actually take people who uh, have an analytical background and they arrive in industry and have to write code every day, and how you teach them about things like version control and good programming practice and patterns and so on. Right, we did a lot of that sort of stuff. Did a lot of sort of like infrastructure stuff around data science, valid R, which you know kind of like validate in our builds, and this thing called data science workbench, which is kind of like a evolution of what we built to allow ourselves to do analytics in, in, in an efficient manner. And I think efficiency, the key, Kate mentioned, you know, you know, the pressure's on, right? More decisions we have to make, we have to empower decisions. To do that, we have to centralize our analytical knowledge and make it executable in some controlled way. But the last thing we want to do is to kind of go, oh, let's build a tool where you can fit any models you want, because that's disaster, right? So that's kind of what we've been looking at. So um, this was built really much in conjunction with clients, uh, particularly from regulatory industries, pharmaceutical and, and insurance in particular. Um, and it's, a, it's a, a set of interfaces and background I, IT infrastructure, essentially. Um, and uh, the idea is the entire thing is built around something called invisible rigor, which was a concept we came up with very early in the project, which was 
we want to be able to actually reproduce our results. We want to be able to actually understand how that was done. We want to be able to come back to a decision and say, why did we make that decision in that moment? But we do not have to fill forms in and stuff like that. So we don't want to actually have the overhead of doing the rigor. We just want it to happen. This is particularly important with people who are perhaps not developers of code, like perhaps a lot of people here are, but people who are tweakers of code. Now, I go into organizations all the time, and I find for every, for every one person who writes our code, there's, a, there's a, you know, 10 people who tweak or use or repurpose uh, you know, the code and use it for themselves. Those people, very often, they don't like interfacing with things like version control software. Like very early on in, in, in this whole thing, we did a, a present, you know, a kind of training course around uh, version control. And, you know, we start, right, repository, head, merge, branch. Ten percent of the people in the room were like, yep, got it, no problem at all, I use it every day anyway. And, and nine out of ten people were like, I don't get why, I don't get the, the terminology, I don't get what this does for me right now. And so it's kind of like making it easy for people to actually collaborate around these things with it in the background. Um, so this is the data science workbench right now. It's a big fluffy drawing, apologies for this. But basically, the important things here is in the background, uh, you've kind of got lots of services. So we've kind of like embedded stuff like security, search using like Solar, you'll see in a second, audit stuff, sharing, uh, Docker, essentially environmental deployment, right? So actually making sure that when you come back and rerun that code that you did last year, you're using the same packages, the right version of R and stuff like that. Um, around this workbench that you see in a second, and it's integrated with desktop tools, and in the website so far we've really focused on the R tools. We've done integration with R Studio Server Pro and Shiny Server Pro. Okay, so that's kind of my... Um... Oh, and by the way, uh, any guys from R Studio in the room, this is why we need a Shiny logo. Uh, so, please. Uh, okay. So, uh, as a quick demo, I'm going to do a quick demo. Um, I, the, um, I'm going to do a mixture of sort of video and uh, sort of live if I can, if my, the internet holds up. Uh, the idea, basically, I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through, uh, uh, you know, some nice ideas. Now, this is where I'm kind of glad that Jonathan Chard isn't here, because he kind of owns uh, Data Science Workbench. And what he doesn't know, and we'll never know, because you're never going to tell him, is that when I branched it, I hacked the CSS thing, thinking I'll make it look a bit cooler. I made it look a little bit uglier, so apologies in advance. But essentially, <clears throat> the whole thing is built around a, a, a single sign-on authentication. So when I sign on to, I sign into Data Science Workbench, I sign into all the other um, things like RStudio servers and Shinies and stuff like that. And the other, th well, I suppose the other way to look at this demo I'm about to show you is this is how some commercial companies are trying to work at how to build infrastructure around analytics to make it fly, right? Not just this te technology itself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to log into this thing. Um, essentially, uh, we found when we built uh, this thing, first of all, that no one actually wanted to know or search for something that was in there unless they knew it was there. So we built a news feed. So this is like a news feed for all the analytic stuff going on in a particular department and stuff like that. So you can see step where it's difficult at the back of the room, maybe, but Steph's doing some Azure stuff. Um, we're doing this chocolate recipe stuff. Um, we are doing uh, presentations and so on. So you can see who's doing what, and you can interact and say, hey, that looks cool. Can I have a look at it? Uh, you can also do things like uh, see updates and feedback. So, hey, this is really cool, or I've updated this. I fixed this bug. You can, it's built into Solar, so I can search across all the metadata, if I'm in R script that does that, a Python script that does this, and so on. So it's kind of search under the hood as well. And what you can do is you can create a project. Now, the idea is to make this seem as, le as you know, a, a little bit less like kind of GitHub, which is kind of, bit, you know, it's Git in the background or subversion in this instance. So you choose a type of project. So in here, I'm choosing a project project. Um, and that has a particular set of d uh, metadata associated with it. So I create that. It creates a repository for me that's taken away from me. It's got metadata that's mandatory for this, um, uh, this, this project type, so I can fill in things like job number and stuff like that. So here, uh, the, the sexiest bit is the least, the worst demo bit, which is this bit coming up. Um, that is the only time you'll see in this demo that I've actually just selected a Docker image by name. That's going to be the one that's used all throughout my R stuff here. So we'll all make sure we're all working in the same versions of R, same packages and stuff like that. Um, I can kind of add some descriptive information. So this is kind of like a project and stuff like that. And so on. You don't want to see me type, so I'll fast forward. Um, then I can do stuff like I can add, add files. So when I add files, I can do that by adding zip files or checking out like repositories and stuff. And you can see what it's done here is it's created two directories. And in the directories, basically I've got two shiny apps uh, uh, here, one called data analysis and one called uh, data scientist. Uh, and what it's done is when you've got a script here, so here's an R script, right? So if I look at my R script, 
Hopefully you can see some of this, but basically there's a load of like require statements in the middle here, so shiny, shiny dashboard, and there's some coding stuff at the top. What this thing does is every time it sees an R script, it can actually rip out all the metadata. So from you here, what it's going to do is actually rip out, and you see it on the front page in a second, it's going to rip out all the metadata from the script and the code uh, from the header. So I can do things like, you can see I've got descriptions and stuff like that. So if I wanted to say, show me every R script that uses Shiny for that customer that was written by this person between these dates, I can do that really quick, basically. Okay, so that's why that metadata comes up and straighten the search index and stuff like that. I can also do stuff like control who has access to this stuff. So I'm going to make Mark an owner of this thing. I'm going to make Steph uh, someone I can share this with. So I can control access if this is like sensitive data and stuff like that. Okay. And then what I can do is at the end is I can publish this thing. This is the only thing that actually looks a bit like a, a, a version control system. I can actually write a commit comment. And basically what that does is I say, hey, I've added some files. Here's a demo project. I hit publish, and all it does is it publishes the thing, tags the thing in version control, and it creates a little news item so people can see that I'm working on this stuff. Okay? Does that make sense? So that was the boring one, right? I've just gone rattled through the really boring one of my videos. I promise the other ones are slightly less boring. Uh, but basically that sets up a project, sets up who can see things, sets up the metadata, sets up the files. I've got a project I can now collaborate on. So whenever anyone's actually doing anything in this project now, I've basically got this thing in the background that monitors it, understands it, versions it, metadata extraction and stuff like that. Okay. Okay, so the other things that you can do uh, with, uh, with this thing then is you might want to edit this stuff, right? So um, essentially what I can do, and I'll flick through this one as well, uh, is you can basically take a file. So you can see in that last example you saw that I had metadata basically because I wrote the code in standards in a particular way, right? So you can enforce standardization of code across your platform. But this one, naughty me, right? This one, ui.r, has no code in header. So I should probably fix that. So what I can do is I can just basically take my code uh, my script in this instance, right? All I can do, and please note if I do that, basically this is one kind of version control entry, which is like, you know, I added the file, right, at a certain date. What I can do is I can take this file, right click, check it out. What that will do is display a nice little Oracle advert for a second, uh, and then it will pop up uh, that file in our studio uh, desktop. I can then do all my work, so I can, you know, edit files. You don't want to see me type this stuff, but basically I can add a, a coding header. Okay, so there's me adding the coding header, and then what I can basically do is check that back in, and when I check that back in, uh, what it does is it then appears back in Data Science Workbench, and everyone can see that Rich just updated that file and did it there. So what you've got is like this, almost like Data Science Workbench, like a hub, and people are going off and doing desktop stuff, take it into Word, do this, take it into RStudio, do that, and checking it back in. And the important thing behind the scenes is it's all very, very easy to use, and so people have to interact with versions and stuff like that. So here we go, that's the header I just added, and if I look at my uh, version uh, history, uh, you can see that I've just added that second entry, okay, the file added. So I can see who's doing what across my analysis project. Okay, so that's all uh, pretty straightforward. Um, what you can do from here, though, the, 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 the cool stuff we've been doing recently is we've now integrated this stuff directly with our Studio Server Professional, which is very cool. So basically what you're able to do is take your project... Okay, you've basically got this little open button right in the middle here, which has got a nice RStudio logo on. Keep your eye on that one. And what that does is it basically opens up my project, this time in RStudio Server. So basically I'm saying, oh, this is my project that we've all set up, but I want to work with it in RStudio Server Pro. It logs you in automatically. You do all your work, kind of make the changes, do all your cool stuff in RStudio Server Pro. And in the background, you basically just submit stuff back to this hub. So basically you've got now a situation where you've got lots of users around using RStudio Server Pro and actually submitting around a central hub. And the cool thing is in the background to this, we've chosen the Docker image for this project. So anyone does anything in this project is all using the right versions of the libraries and files and stuff like that. So you're never in that situation where someone will get out of sync. But you haven't got to have a situation where your user has to interact with some of the complexities around that, so pack right and stuff like that. It's kind of all just done behind the scenes, essentially. Okay. Um, and then and, you know, what I've done here is I've added some stuff in the background. I added a, um, uh, you know, a little check-in comment, which is like add, added header to file. And what that does is that goes back into uh, Data Science Workbench. And if you click on the thing, then you can see the commit comment, which is there. And you can see the, the version history and stuff like that. So, so you kind of got a situation now. We've got like a hub and lots of people using RStudio server in a collaborative manner, in a standardized way around a project. Now, I've kind of done this entire thing because I wanted to show you this next bit, so very quickly. And I'm going to try and do this live because I'm that stupid right now. Let's sort of go. Okay. So this is the project you saw in the video, right? And this is Data Science Workbench. Um, 
we've been doing this, and in my demo earlier that I flicked through, I basically give access to Steph in order to actually see the results of this project. Okay, so no one else can see the results right now. I've controlled that. But what if I actually want to deploy this thing? Well, the cool thing here is, right, in this project, I've basically got two shiny dashboard apps. Okay, so what I can do is I can just cross my fingers and hit this little button here. Now, what it's going to do when I hit this button is it's going to search for all the shiny apps in this project, build an index for them, build a home page, and deploy them onto a brand new shiny server like this. So it's momentarily, basically, but all that's done in the background, right, is deployed Shiny Server Pro, allowed me to do the authentication, so I'm still logged in, right? It's built me an index page, and what it's done is it's found things like the project name, the metadata, and all the Shiny apps at the moment it found in that project. So what I can now do is actually send this URL to Steph, who can log in, see this page, and see all the work I'm doing in the Shiny apps, and interact with them. But if I send it to someone else in the room, they wouldn't be able to actually get into this point. So it's a way of actually automatically sharing shiny apps in some way with people. So then I can do stuff like, you know, if I'm, if I'm Steph, I, I, I log in, I click this button and hope. Hey. So there's one of my shiny apps, right? This is a, a little shiny app we built recently that's got things like, uh, um, you know, some nice stuff in. Uh, don't ask why they call this feature and stuff. Um, so there's a little shiny app that I've been playing with, okay? Um, and then I can go back. And what I might want to do is click on the data scientist thing, which is the other shiny app I've decided to share with uh, Steph. That will open up my, um, uh, my shiny app with uh, my HTM widget, widget stuff, which again I'll be talking about in the next session. If you want to know what this actually is, come back in the next session. And then actually my users can actually get my results. Now the cool thing in the background is if I now go back in our studio server and tweak something, I can push this directly into this portal and my user just gets an updated app and stuff like that. So that's kind of where that integration sits. So that was really quick and really rough, and I did a lot of like flicking through weird videos, but hopefully you get the feel for a kind of hub with people working in the interfaces that they like to work in, with my users getting shiny apps in their work in, and underneath the whole thing, all that versioning and provenance and security and audit is just taken care of, and I don't have to interact with it, essentially. Um, <clears throat> so that's kind of where we are right now. In terms of where we're going, uh, right now uh, our customers up around this that we're working with are starting to get ideas about what else we could integrate with. And because of the way we've actually built this, we can integrate with other things. So uh, the Jupyter stuff is ongoing, so we can pretty much integrate with that now. Plotly and Plotly dashboards is the next thing we'll integrate with. And our customers have asked us to integrate with things like Stash um, for like uh, GitHub kind of like double referencing, Slack for sort of um, interactions, so you can kind of like have a chat around your analysis, which is a sort of thing like two years ago I would have built myself, right? Um, Wonderlist and Evernote to make notes about the insight you're gaining throughout that analysis, all in that sort of collaborative manner. But the idea is the analysis itself is centralized and you can actually go from there, basically. Okay, so hopefully that was just a quick snapshot of two things, I suppose. Number one is, uh, you know, kind of what we've been doing around this, but number two is how we see companies trying to build infrastructure around analytics so analytics can be enabled very quickly, essentially. Okay, and if there's any questions, then I'll, I'll take some questions. Thank you.